have additional seminars um, that are called Find by the Pint, and these happen at the Burren in Davis Square, as well as Aeronaut Brewery. And these are events where we bring faculty to give brief talks and answer questions from the public. And I just want to emphasize that all of these events are, of course, free, and no registration is required. Yeah, and something um, to tease you with coming up this spring is our second annual DayCon, which Katie is heading up this year, which is a day-long science conference that's happening Saturday, June 11th. Um, and so there'll be more information about that as we progress throughout the spring, so definitely stay tuned. And I also just want to plug our website once more, sitinboston.com. We just did a complete overhaul, redesign, we're really proud of it. So please uh, take a look, sign up for our mailing list, um, and learn more about us there. Um, and so just to give you an idea of what's going to happen tonight, we have Ginny who's going to be presenting on her research. Um, we're really excited to have her talk. She's one of our outgoing co-directors, so you may recognize her. She used to be up here giving this introduction before. Um, and so she'll be talking to us about uh, skin deep illuminating our body's immune defenses. And so we like to keep our lectures very interactive. So there'll be a number of question breaks throughout her talk, so please feel free to raise your hands. Um, there'll also be an intermission about halfway through where you can come up and speak with Vinny then as well. Um, additionally, we have um, some surveys that are out there and some pens, so please fill out um, your thoughts um, on Denise's talk and help give us some feedback that she can use to improve her communication skills and also let us know what you liked about today's talk as well. Um, so without further ado, we'll hand it over to Vinny and we hope you guys enjoy tonight. All right, good evening everyone. Thank you for coming out today. Um, I'm really excited to welcome you to the first spring seminar. My name is Vinny and I'll be talking to you a little bit about my research, which is on the skin and the immune system in the skin. And uh, we'll go a little bit more in depth into what I study and more how I study it as well. So if you're wondering what this gamish of fluorescence over here is, uh, believe it or not, this is an image that I took of the mouse skin where I'm looking at cells of the immune system actually healing a wound. And by the end of the lecture, hopefully you'll be able to read all about this and understand everything that's going on. So that's one of the main goals. So the skin is the largest organ in our bodies and is the first barrier of entry to many potential pathogens or bad bugs. And the tightly regulated immune system in our skin provides us with a very robust arsenal to combat potential invaders, but also has checkpoints to ensure that all these battlefields don't harm our own bodies in return. So one of the main questions is to understand how immunity in the skin might protect us. And this is important to study briefly, well, because we want to understand how we can fight disease, how we can better fight disease, and also um, potentially prevent it from happening in the first place by boosting our barrier defenses through vaccination strategies. So tonight, while the immune system is very vast and complex, as I'm learning the very hard way through my PhD, tonight we'll first briefly talk about uh, some of the main players in the immune system in the skin that will be relevant for tonight's lecture, and then go focus on some cutting edge techniques that immunologists are using in the lab today to study um, some of the questions that we're trying to address. And finally, I'll hopefully set the stage to talk about how um, I, I study making immunological memory in the lab, and we'll walk through an experiment together at the end. My project, really excited about that. So let's talk about the skin. I'm gonna put this question out to all of you guys, open up the floor. So knowing the scary, scary things that are out there in the world, like bugs, diseases, what would you want your skin immune system to do or not to do in order to protect yourself from those things? Back there. All right. Anybody else? Heal quickly. Alex. Prevent, prevent dirt from coming in. All right. So some of these things, the immune system does all of those things and, and way, way more. It's very multifaceted. Um, it takes like this team of 
cells with specialized functions to do all these things. So obviously the immune system can keep pathogens from invading our bodies. And it can also kill any infected or abnormal cells that are in the skin. Um, it can sense any invaders. And the cool thing is that it'll alert the rest of the immune system um, to be on guard and, and fight whatever invader comes in. Um, will help clear all the debris. So heal wounds quickly and um, clean up the war zone. So um, things that you wouldn't even expect the immune system to do on a normal basis, healing wounds, and also prevents the body from attacking itself. So if you guys have heard of diseases like psoriasis and lupus, those are what we call autoimmune diseases. And it's important for us uh, in our immune system to have these checkpoints so that we don't attack ourselves, our own body's cells. Immune system does so much more than that also. And we're still discovering a lot of this as scientists. So we're going to talk a little bit about how this very well-oiled and poised machine works. And it takes a team of very specialized cells with functions. So we'll start with the starting lineups here and show you how they're situated and come together. So this is the skin. This is like a cross section of the skin. The top part is the epidermis, which is a, a very thin layer of skin that that you can actually see on the top of your skin right now. Below that is the dermis. Atop all of this, uh, which, are, which may be invisible to our eyes, are actually millions and millions of microbes that are bacteria and viruses that can actually produce factors that also allow us to fend off bad bugs as well. The first cell, or the first component of the immune system I'm gonna talk to you about is the dendritic cell. The dendritic cell sits all over the skin. It's actually surveying constantly uh, for any bugs that are going to come through. And when it does encounter a bug, like this little monster here, it's going to educate the rest of the cells of the immune system to be able to respond to that bug. So one of the things that this monster is going to do is create this huge mess. And uh, we have this guy, the macrophage, that's going to help clear up all of that mess and help heal the wounds, and also going to recruit more immune cells into the skin in order to help um, fight this little monster. Um, then we have what are called T cells or the helper T cells. And the helper T cells as they come in are sort of um, like the, the generals and they're instructing other cells within the environment what to do, like how to attack this particular bug. And then we have the killer T cells, which are basically 007, licensed to kill. They have the ability to um, specifically find um, bugs and then attack and kill any infected cells that have those bugs inside of them. We also have B cells and these are important because they make antibodies and finally some of these killer cells after they're done fighting the bug can actually stick around and become memory cells and memory cells which we're going to talk about a little bit more in a second actually allow us to have a much quicker response to the particular bug. So if you see this bug a second time, you're going to be able to nip it in the bud right away. As you can imagine, this entire process, um, getting it all started, is going to take a few days. Whereas if you're able to create memory cells, uh, the next time you see the bug, you'll be able to fight it off within a couple of days. So in the lab, I study skin memory T cells. And memory cells are very, very important for our immune response to these pesky pathogens that invade our bodies, primarily because of how quickly they alert the rest of the immune system to the, battle, uh, to the battlefield, essentially. And as you may guess from this description, we might want to figure out how skin memory cells are made so that we can learn how to uh, preemptively protect ourselves from different pathogens. Another facet of memory T cells is that they're able to specifically recognize and remember certain pathogens. So if I recognize Amy in the audience as a memory cell over here, if I see Steph as, as another pathogen that's trying to invade, I, I won't be able to recognize her, but the next time I see Amy, I'm gonna call all the forces in to cart her out. <laughs> um, they'll quickly alert the surrounding cells to uh, recruit more help. They're also constantly surveying the skin like dendritic cells. And what's really important about them is that they're very long lived. So we think they may even last a lifetime. In humans, it's very hard to do these experiments, but um, presumably you have memory forever. So that's what we call immunological memory. So here, I actually have a little video for you of what skin memory T cells look like. And we just talked about um, dendritic cells as well. 
And in red, you have dendritic cells that are uh, hanging out, probing, and still surveying the skin. And you also, in green, have these skin memory T cells that are just hanging out. So they're constantly moving and surveying their environment. They're never static. And that's something I want you to remember about the immune system. It's never just a snapshot in place. It's always in action. But how do immune cells know what to do and when to do it? They can do all of these cool things. So we'll take a step back before we dive into that in particular. And I want to go over some terms that will be useful in uh, trying to understand how the immune system works or immune cells work. So this is a cell. If you remember, this is a macrophage, but it doesn't matter what kind of cell it is for now. Um, this is the nucleus. The nucleus is what contains all the genetic material, and we'll go over a little bit more about what the genetic material is later. But it's basically the control center of the cell that tells it what to do and what to do next. And all of this, all of the functions inside a cell or outside of a cell are carried up carried out by little machines called proteins. And we'll go over what proteins are in just a second. But uh, there are many different types of proteins. They can be receptors, second messengers, cytokines. Um, and they're all carrying out different functions within and outside of the cell. And we'll discuss uh, these three in particular and their functions in immunity. So how are these immune cells actually sensing these cues? So if you take a look at an interaction between a dendritic cell and a T cell, like they're hanging out next to each other, cells have all of these receptors. They're sort of like ornaments that they're using to survey their, their environments. And they can take in signals from their environment through these receptors and these different types of receptors. One type of signal they can take in is um, called a cell-cell interaction where something will bind the receptor that's coming from another cell. And so they're basically like, it's sort of like a handshake between two cells and they're communicating with each other. Another way a cell can get a signal is through something called a cytokine. And a cytokine is a factor, a, basically a protein that's produced by any cell in the area, maybe even also immune cells. And the cells can integrate all of these signals and potentially carry out different functions and respond to them in a certain way. So imagine this, like each cell has hundreds and hundreds of different types of receptors, maybe even thousands. So we really want to understand how they can, you know, integrate these hundreds of different signals in order to carry out a particular function. So this is what happens on the outside of a cell. But on the inside of a cell, um, part of the response is that um, when you get a signal from the outside, Sometimes the signals can be relayed by what we call a second messenger. And this is going to be important for the third part of the lecture. But when a cell receives a signal, let's say a cytokine signal, a second messenger can actually go into the nucleus and allow the and tell the nucleus, OK, carry something out. And the control center will then allow the cell to carry out a different action. So let's take an example of how signals can be potentially integrated into this battlefield of events. And we'll go over this with the skin memory T cell. So we know that T cells are long, skin memory T cells are long lived. And so they must be constantly getting some signal that tells them to survive. But they also recognize infected cells. So when an infected cell comes along, this uh, memory cell produces some cytokine that calls macrophages in. And then those macrophages will call in killer T cells that then produce more protein that will kill that infected cell and neutralize it. So there are all of these things going on. And immune cells are constantly sensing and responding to different cues. So they can potentially take in um, a number of different signals, both from cytokines and from cell-cell interactions. But how do they integrate that information? And what do they do? So they can make more proteins. They can make different proteins. They can move around. So we saw that they were dynamic and they're, they're sort of just like surveying their environment. But they can also travel long distances. Um, they're able to kill cells, heal wounds, become a memory cell, which we'll talk about a little bit later, and maybe other functions as well. So the way that I like to think about this, like if a cell gets many different signals through its like hundreds or thousands of different receptors, how does it decide what to do? So I think of it like a situation room, like sort of a battlefield. So if you, if you guys remember this, this is a very famous, I guess now historical picture 
of the Situation Room when um, they were when Obama was taking down uh, Osama bin Laden. But here, um, I think the point that I want to sort of get across to you is that I mean they're all like immune cells. So. I mean, this lieutenant general here is trying to take in the signals from his environment. You know, everybody's talking to each other. But at the end of the day, each cell needs to understand what it's going to do at that point in time, or maybe like five minutes from now. So this is what we what I like to call like the study of immune cell decision making. And this is one of the guiding principles for, I mean, what we study every day in the lab. So uh, think about that. It's always like. A situation room. One of the decision-making processes that I'm particularly interested in is to understand how uh, killer, tell, killer T cells can turn into memory cells and what the decision-making process is. And we'll go a little bit more in depth into that in both the second and third parts of the talk. And um, if we can really sort of figure this out and create memory cells, we can figure out how to better vaccine development. So this is sort of the summary of the first part of the talk. We've learned that the skin is composed of all these diverse types of uh, immune cells that can protect us from pathogens, keep us disease free, and um, do other awesome cool things that we're still trying to figure out. Um, memory T cells in particular in the skin are important in order to quickly respond to uh, any little pesky pathogens and prevent the spread of them. And all immune cells, and this is one of the most important points of the, of the talk, there's one thing that you can take away, uh, this is it. Like all immune cells can integrate many signals and respond accordingly. And this is what we're trying to study. And um, hopefully, hopefully we'll get somewhere cool with that. So do we have any questions for the first part? Yes, back there. Okay, so the, the question is what destroys the memory cells? Um, so if a memory cell is um, sort of, it, if it gets infected on its own or um, it loses the ability to survive, so say it loses a survival signal, um, that can allow the cell to be destroyed. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you might have a cascade if it interacts with all of the other ones. So I, the other thing I want to point out is... Um, all of these cells are constantly interacting with each other. We're just going to focus on the memory cell. They're all talking to each other. So there is going to be some sort of like checks and balances that, that makes sure um, nothing gets harmed. Yes? So, so these receptors are, are probably chemical interactions that go on. Mm -hmm. so, so you have all these chemical interactions that are going on in the cell, and somehow Yeah. So, so the, I guess the the question is like, if you're having all these chemical interactions that a cell is is taking in through the receptors, um, so what is the mechanism that's controlling uh, what is and what isn't taken in? So that's a really really good question that we as scientists are trying to figure out. One of the things is that um, each immune cell has a different uh, combination of receptors. So they are poised to respond only to certain things. So that sort of filters some of the messages out. And the other thing is a lot of them have um, similar second messengers and there are other um, there are other things that may allow a cell to like override one signal or prioritize one signal over another. And we're still trying to figure that out. Yeah, right here. Alert from different direction. Mm -hmm. Seven enemies. Mm -hmm. Seven sites. Mm -hmm. How who will decide the nucleus or uh, the enemy decide which enemies more vulnerable? Ah. How will the enemy? Okay, so that's a good question. Um, if you have, let's say, like seven enemies in a battlefield, and uh, how does how does a cell decide like which one to go after and which one is the worst? So the cool thing about the immune system is that each of those seven enemies probably already has, um, it, it could even already have a memory cell, but it could just have um, like a set of immune responses that's gonna attack all of them together. So there are certain, oh, go ahead. 
they can. So they have the potential to do that. So cells like macrophages and other like helper T cells and things like that, they're always, there's gonna be like a battlefield where you have like side casualties as well. And so some of the proteins that are produced are gonna affect um, most of the viruses. So there, there's a class of proteins called interferons. And when interferons are produced, um, whether you recognize virus A or virus B, you're going to be able to sort of neutralize those effects so that your immune response can then uh, go and attack the specific viruses later. So there's a way to slow it down. And one more question. So if you're, if you're constantly exercising and you're getting more oxygen in your blood, um, do you have um, a better immune response to pathogens? Maybe, that hasn't been well studied. Obviously every cell in the body, just like immune cells, um, will need a good amount of nutrients. So if you get your blood flowing and you get more oxygen, you're gonna allow for nutrients to be able to get to the places that they need to go, but there hasn't been anything in particular to study that. And then one more. So the sun, uh, the skin can respond to things like the sun, metabolize vitamin D. So all of that is part of like, there are immune cells in the skin, but there are also like barrier cells in the skin that are just all working together. So the immune cells I think are just there to protect the skin so that we can allow those other functions to happen, right? And it's also possible that the vitamin D that's metabolized by the, um, or vitamin D that gets broken down by the skin can be used as a nutrient for the immune cells as well. It's all one big network. All right, so I'll move on to the second part of the talk. So now we know we have to study signals, but how we study signals is uh, something that I really wanna get into a little bit more. So in order to sort of take, well, we'll take a step back and to understand the way that the immune system works, immunologists can use a couple of different big types of models. One is something called an in vitro system, in vitro experimental system, where you are basically uh, culturing cells inside of media and a tissue culture flask, isolated, and the pro of this, if we're trying to understand human disease and uh, make better vaccines and things like that for humans, the pro of this is that you're using human cells and you don't have to use animals in research. The problem with this is that it doesn't capture the complexity of the signals. So when you're putting something into a dish, maybe it doesn't get all of the signals that it would inside of you know, the regular skin. So another way and most that most immunologists use is actually to use in vivo models. And we mostly do these in mice. And the importance of doing this in mice or the benefit of doing this in mice is that it sort of allows us to understand these complex dynamics and signals and, and how all of this is regulated as a big network. But obviously there is the caveat that um, there isn't totally perfect correlation with human immunity, but I do wanna point out that um, a lot of the immunological studies that have been done in mice do translate to um, humans as well. If you have heard of cancer immunotherapies, um, the latest uh, block antibody-based blockade, which you'll hear about, I guess, uh, a couple of lectures from now, where actually the targets were, drug targets were actually discovered in mice and then went through the pipeline to um, be used in humans as well. And so because I'm trying to understand how immune cells take in and integrate all of these complex signals to allow for a certain function to happen, I'm mostly gonna be using mouse models. So we wanna study decision-making and signals in the immune system. And we sort of need a like starting point. So if we wanna study a particular signal, what we do is like we sort of poke the system or we change something in the system and see how um, the system responds to that and sort of monitor those things. And um, this is how we like essentially identify like essential cytokines and interactions that are important for particular immune functions. So the first question is to understand like how we're able to alter, like how do scientists even like alter and study how signals 
are integrated by immune cells. So um, actually, I want to ask that to you. How do you think we might go about that? No thoughts? All right. Well, well, we'll go there. We'll walk through it slowly. So if you remember, proteins are sort of these little machines that allow cells to receive signals and carry out functions. So one way to play with signals is to sort of modify all of these different proteins and see how it affects um, the particular immune cell or the immune response. So we can alter them, alter their function, and study the effects on immune cell function. And one of the ways to alter proteins is to use uh, genetic, I'm going to call it genetic manipulation. So to understand how this works, we'll slowly go through what we call the central dogma. And I see a lot of regulars in the audience as well, so some of you may already know this. But um, the way that um, genetics works is that um, <laughs> This is the holy grail. Uh, I mean, this is the basis of, of most biology that we do. So all of, the, uh, I talked a little bit earlier about uh, genetic material that's stored in the nucleus. So DNA is what this genetic material is. And it basically is a sort of a recipe book that contains all the information that's needed to make your recipes, which are your proteins. And uh, DNA will basically photocopy itself in order to make RNA. And then the RNA is what gets made into a particular protein. So for example, like a second messenger or a receptor or something. So if we then can change, if we want to change a protein, we can actually modify DNA, let's say, like cut out a piece of it. And that, will, that change will also translate into what's happening in the RNA. And then at the end, you get a protein that's particularly, that's modified. So maybe that second messenger has uh, impaired function. Another way to change a protein's function is to use what we call an antibody. And an antibody, remember, uh, is produced by the, a B cell, which is one of the types of immune cells. And antibodies are fun because they can bind to specific proteins and they can alter their function. So they um, recognize hopefully one thing and one thing only. Another way to do this is uh, to use a small chemical or a drug that can uh, alter a protein's function. So now we know like how to perturb the system in a, in a few ways and change the way that cells take in signals. But what happens when you alter the signals? Like how do you read this out? How do you monitor these functional changes? And if we go back to how cells sort of respond to signals, they can, immune cells in particular, when they take in signals, they can do all of these different things. But I'm gonna focus in on the fact that they can make more or different proteins once they get a particular signal. So to look at proteins on signal cells, immunologists love to use this technique called flow cytometry. And I know all of the non-immunologists that are still scientists in the audience are probably cringing at this, but we'll, we'll take this slowly. So say we're doing an experiment with mouse immune cells. So what we're gonna do is isolate the cells from a mouse, um, and then these particular cells will be making all, si all sorts of proteins, so they have receptors, maybe cytokines, and we can label the cells with antibodies in different colors. And then once we label those cells, um, and these antibodies are tagged to what we call a fluorochrome, and we'll talk about fluorescence in just a second. So once we've labeled the antibodies, we can measure the amount of color of each type of color that you have, so you can understand how much protein of that particular type is on that cell or on a mixture of cells. How exactly do we do this? So we'll take a little step back and talk about fluorescence. So chemical structures take in energy in the form of light or like heat or radiation, whatever, whatever you like. And when they take in that energy and get excited, um, they have to, what goes up must come back down. And so when they come back down, some structures have the property that allows them to release the energy in the form of light. So we, we call that fluorescence. And here's a commonly used fluorochrome, which can be put onto an antibody. It's called phycoerythrin, and it's been isolated from a red algae. And another commonly used reagent, which we'll talk about later, um, is the green fluorescent protein. So you can use different smaller chemicals, or you can use um, fluorescent proteins, like larger things. Um, 
in order to sort of label your, your different cells. So going back to this, going back to flow cytometry, so we're labeling cells with antibodies that have different colored fluorochromes on them. And then we're gonna be measuring the amount of fluorescence that each cell has of all of these different colors. So the reason it's called flow cytometry is that you take a bunch of different cells, you have like millions of cells that you've taken from your mouse, and you sort of put it through a flow cell, why it's called flow, and that flow cell is going to allow um, cells to come out of the other end one at a time. And as they're coming out the other end one at a time, there's a laser or there are multiple lasers that are shining light on them in order to get the um, fluorescence to be, uh, in order to have the molecules fluoresce. And so there are a bunch of filters on the other end that then pick up or detect this fluorescence so that you can measure it. And this is what that machine looks like, or uh, this is not, a, not as big as some of the other ones that we're using, but this is what a flow cytometer is. So at the end of the day, um, what it spits out is something like this, like a dot plot. This is crazy, but we'll go through this step by step. So each one of these dots or pixels here represents one cell. And on, the, on one axis, we're looking at the fluorescence of one protein. And on the other axis, we're looking at the fluorescence of another protein. And what I didn't tell you before was that certain types of immune cells, or each type of immune cell can sort of be distinguished from another by the fact that they produce a different set of proteins. And so different combinations of proteins can allow us to identify different types of cells. And so over here, a memory cell will express, let's say, let's just call them protein A and protein B. And so if you are looking at an increasing fluorescence of protein B and an increasing fluorescence of protein A, what you see in this red box over here are actually memory cells. And there are really that many memory cells in one uh, ear skin of a mouse. And so um, this sort of will help me figure out what types of cells I'm looking at and maybe also think about like what other proteins might be used. So in a flow cytometer, you can use maybe up to like 14 or 15 different colors. So you can identify that many different proteins at one time. So proteins, it's not just, they're not just, you know, hanging out. They can also tell us a lot about cell functions. So flow cytometry is a really powerful tool. So there are different types of proteins. There are things like granzyme and perforin are two types of proteins that are actually used by killer cells to kill a cell. So if a, a cell is making granzyme, then you know that it is a killer T cell because it's poised to to kill its target cell. You also have various other proteins like different cytokine receptors and um, molecules that will, proteins that will allow other uh, cells to interact with other cells and so much more. And because of this, flow, flow is a very, very useful tool, but it really does have its limitations. So we talked about responses to signals. You can make more, you can make different proteins and cells can also like migrate and communicate with other cells. So flow cytometry, while it allows us to detect all of these proteins and sort of make educated guesses about what might be happening, it can't tell us everything. We don't know if a cell is gonna migrate in a particular direction or what kind of other cells that it might be interacting with. And there's so much other information that we're really missing. Um, and so flow cytometry sort of gives us a rather static view of a very dynamic and like constantly changing system. So we have to think about that and use multiple techniques in order to um, understand what's really going on in the immune system. And to do that, I use um, another tool called two-photon intravital microscopy. So let's take that in. That's a lot of words. So two-photon, it's like two, which are photons are like packets of energy. In this case, it's gonna be light energy, uh, intravital inside of a living animal. So I'm gonna do this inside of a mouse. Uh, microscopy, most of you know what microscopy is, but you're basically looking at and sort of magnifying any type of small object. So what two photon micros microscopy does is it actually allows us to look deep into various organs like the skin and um, illuminate them, let's say, and that's how I generated that image up there. 
and allows us to take real-time videos. So what we do in two-photon IBM, we'll call it, to study immune cells is to label the cells with different fluorescent proteins or even fluorochromes. Um, and then we can excite those proteins. So we talked about in flow cytometry using a laser in order to um, excite a fluorochrome or fluorescent protein. You're using the same thing here, except the laser is slightly different. Um, and it can allow you to go deep into the organ and look at things in the epidermis and in the dermis. And then finally, this is the fun part. You get to take movies with a microscope. And so here, this is that same image that you saw before, except now it's a video. Uh, you see immune cells that are just moving around. In red, you have dendritic cells. And in green, you have uh, T cells that are hanging out and trying to heal a wound. And the blue that you see here is actually collagen that represents the dermis of the skin. So these microscopes are huge. They can take up an entire room. Like each one of these things is, a, is where all of the laser light sort of gets moved around. And that's just like one little computer. And this is where I would put the mouse up there under the microscope. So I was actually gonna take a selfie with it, but I couldn't get the whole thing in the picture. So maybe next time. But this is a two-photon microscope, takes up an entire room. So two-photon is, is really good at telling us um, what happens in real time. It can give us dynamic readings of like cell-to-cell -cell interactions, like which cells are maybe talking to each other, and how cells might migrate in an environment. And like when a, a good question that was asked earlier is like you see like seven different pathogens, like how do you know where to go? And migration is really important, like how cells are taking cues to, to go to one place and fight a battle is really important for us. We can also obviously do a lot, lot more. And we'll talk about the lot, lot more in the third part. But that's if you use it creatively. So there are a lot of limitations of two-photon microscopy. Um, our lab is one of the few that actually uses this for immun immunology purposes, uh, mostly because it's very expensive and it is very time consuming. So to take one of those videos and to have one like functional pretty video for you will probably be like me spending 20-ish, maybe more hours in a dark room trying to get images out of a mouse. <laughs> So it can be exceedingly time consuming. And the other issue for us as immunologists is that currently we have very limited tools and reagents to use for this in particular, but we're sort of building those right now um, to overcome that hurdle. So in summary, we sort of talked about this um, in this part of the lecture, how we can manipulate genes or like block protein function in order to modify or like modulate uh, signals that might be taken in by immune cells. And then to read out what happens um, as a result of changing these signals, we look at loop to flow cytometry to figure out which proteins might be expressed on the surface of a cell or what other proteins the cell is making. And also in my lab, we use two photon intravital microscopy. And that's, that allows us to see all of these real-time dynamic changes in immune cell function that we wouldn't normally be able to do otherwise. So I'm going to pause for questions again. Yes, back there. So there are people, so the question is there are a lot of people that get it infected all the time and how does that uh, influence or how is that involved in what I study? Um, and I basically, everybody sort of studies different aspects of the immune system. So I will, I basically study how um, certain types of cells are taking in different signals to integrate that. And so using one type of cell as a model system for that or as a as one example I can take that information and also apply it in a different context to study um, people you know like situations where people might really get infected all the time so it's not uh, per se exactly what I'm studying but um, it's some of the same information can be used for that as well yes
Yeah, so the question is, do I infect mice with particular pathogens to see their reactions? And yes, I do. So we'll, in the third part of the lecture, we'll talk more about uh, what I study in the lab, but I'm actually vaccinating mice so that they, they can try to fend off infection. So I mostly work with herpes simplex virus and sometimes um, listeria as well, listeria monocytogenes, stuff that you can get food poisoning from. <laughs> All right, anybody else? Okay, excellent. So we're gonna take a very brief intermission right now. Um,
All right, so we're going to get started again. So now I get to talk to you about my research, and I'm really excited about it because most scientists love to incessantly talk about what they do. But now that I've hopefully laid down a foundation of how we study things, um, it'll be easy for, for all of us to understand exactly what's happening in the lab, what I do every day, and why I do it. So we're going to talk about generating memories and the type of information that scientists need to know in order to make better vaccines. So if you remember memory T cells, like how can you forget memory T cells? They're awesome. They do so many cool things. Um, they're very, very important for our immune response to pathogens so that we can respond to bugs that are, you know, uh, hitting us quickly and nip them in the bud. And what this can be really, really useful for is if we are able to generate memory against a pathogen that we may have never seen before, um, let's say something like herpes or even like HIV, um, then you might be able to fend off the pathogen before it, get, it becomes too late and causes a very terrible infection or even worse. And so um, I wanna understand exactly how killer, killer T cells can become memory cells. And we can use this as sort of the basis for uh, generating vaccines. So most vaccines, you'll, you'll hear a lot about um, antibodies that are produced by uh, the flu vaccine or something like that. But also very successful vaccines produce different types of memory, including memory T cells that are gonna allow us to, you know, get these pathogens at the gate before they can even come in. And so I wanna understand this process. And, oops, yes. So we wanna understand how to make better vaccines. So some of the useful information that we can use is to under, first understand like what signals do cells even receive to become memory cells. So what does a T, killer T cell recognize in its environment that says, hey, okay, I'm gonna become a memory cell today because I thought that would be fun. And then next, like where do these signals come from? So a lot of different cells are producing different types of signals and maybe even some of them producing the same type of signal. But maybe where it comes from is also important in order uh, for memory to, uh, to be made. And sort of um, understanding this will help us target the exact cell types and the exact type of uh, signals and cytokines that might be produced in order to generate a very like targeted uh, vaccine or therapy. So if you remember how, to, how we uh, talked about studying signals in the immune system before, we're gonna put it into the context of how we might be able to generate a memory cell from a killer T cell. So you can change and modify those signals and then figure out what happens when you alter those signals. So if I wanna apply this uh, understanding to what signals are needed to make a memory cell, um, we can start from a hypothesis that I have, and I'm gonna have you guys walk me through exactly how I should do these experiments. That's what you're here for. So I already have a hypothesis that I think that there's a cytokine uh, called TGF-beta that is needed for killer cells in order to become memory cells. So how might I go about testing this hypothesis? What might I do? Okay, so you can label something that produces that cytokine, maybe. Maybe down the road, yes. Or, yeah. Awesome, that's very close. So he's saying you can add, add the cytokine to killer T cells and see if they're gonna become memory cells. That's a very, very good answer. And then look by flow cytometry. So you got a lot of that second part. So one of the ways that I would do this to see what's necessary, if TGF beta is necessary, first I would also add that cytokine to the T cells. But the other thing that you can do is to um, sort of block TGF beta uh, or the cell's ability to respond to TGF beta and see if you can still make memory cells. So it's basically the same thing, just like flipped around to see what's essential. So we can block these. And um, we're gonna walk through an experiment that I've done. And so we can do this by flow cytometry. So 
let's take a step back and figure out how we know at the end. So if we modify TGF beta or modify the cell's ability to take in a TGF beta signal, how are we going to read it out? How do we know if we generate memory? And one is to look at these surface level properties and look by flow cytometry for different proteins that are expressed by memory cells. And we already know, based on a lot of different studies that have been done by many scientists, what sort of proteins are expressed by these cells or what proteins uh, the memory cells make. The other thing we can do is to test the function of memory cells. So memory cells are going to help you uh, fight off a pathogen much more quickly, right? So what I would do is I would take a mouse that has memory cells or a mouse that doesn't have me or a mouse that doesn't have memory cells. Um, basically, try to vaccinate them, do whatever that's necessary after blocking function or not blocking function of this protein, and then challenge them with a little monster. And if they have memory, um, at the end, the the ones that have memory should be very happy. They should be fine. Whereas the ones that have not generated functional memory are uh, going to be sad. But um, because we can do all of this an easier way by just looking at the proteins that are expressed on the surface of the cell, we're going to do this by flow cytometry. So if you remember, we're going to call them, again, protein A and protein B. And uh, these two proteins are expressed or made by memory T cells. And protein A, let's say protein A is very important for allowing the cells to be in the skin for a very long time. Protein B, we actually still don't know what it does. So maybe you guys can help me figure that one out. <laughs> so now what does blocking TGF beta do to memory cell generation? So this is what normal memory cells would look like up in this red box if you don't block TGF beta. And if you block TGF beta, what happens is these cells almost all go away and you don't get any memory, which is really, really sad. So what this experiment does tell us, though, is that um, TGF beta is a particular signal that is important for uh, killer T cells to take in and to, in order to become a memory cell. But that's just one signal, right? And we also don't know exactly where it comes from. And so to understand where these signals come from, now we can use microscopes, two-photon IVM, in order to help us find out what's happening. So how can we actually learn more about TGF beta signals? So remember, for two-photon IVM, we need to have something that's fluorescent that can sort of tell us when a T cell is going to receive a TGF beta signal or how it has received a TGF beta signal. And what's really cool is that there is this second messenger called SMAD that actually goes into the nucleus when a cell can receive TGF beta signals. So we know what SMAD looks like. And we're going to use genetic modification, what we talked about earlier, to make this property useful to us for studying this by two-photon microscopy. I think you almost got it earlier on. So if you take the DNA for SMAD, you can actually put in right next to it a DNA that encodes uh, GFP, the green fluorescent protein. So these are linked together. It makes one big gigantic protein. And that goes into the RNA as well. And what you end up with is what we call a fusion protein reporter. So this is SMAD GFP is what we're going to call it for the rest of the day. So you can take this SMAD GFP and you can actually put this into T cells. And the T cell, when it takes in a TGF beta signal then, will um, have all of these little SMAD proteins go into the nucleus. So all of the GFP, or some of the GFP, is going to go into the nucleus. And here I've labeled the nucleus in red because we can actually mark it with a red fluorescent protein in the same way to make a fusion protein with um, something that is fused to a protein that's expressed in the nucleus. So that's a way for us to track exactly where these things are at any given point in time. And so when you have all of this GFP going into the nucleus, you'll have a yellow nucleus. And this is important because I'm going to show you this, what's happening in, in a video on the next slides. So we take these cells that have gotten this TGF beta reporter, this GFP SMAD, we put them into mice, and then I can image them over the course of um, killer cells becoming uh, resident uh, memory T cells in the ear skin. 
So again, red nucleus means a cell is not receiving a TGF beta signal, and a yellow nucleus means it is receiving a TGF beta signal. So what this looks like in an actual mouse is this. So all these cells are sort of moving around. This might get really confusing. But what we have here is um, a hair follicle, so ignore that. But anything that's in green is a T cell that's moving around that has um, GFP. And you can see actually some of the cells that have yellow nuclei that are um, signaling with this MAD reporter. And anything that's in plain red with no green um, is actually a dendritic cell. So you can sort of mark the territories in which T cells are hanging out in and figure out exactly where and when they might be getting the TGF beta signals. So you can potentially identify the source of these. And the ones, the cells that you see with the blue nuclei are actually control cells. So we know that um, everything is working the way that it should work. And what we can do with this information is actually uh, quantify it over um, time. So in this little video over here, we're going to have a, um, we have this red cell, up, this green cell with a red nucleus that we're looking at right now. And I quantify SMAD signaling based on something called the signaling index, which is the amount of the GFP that has gotten into the nucleus over time. And you can map this. And you can see that it's constantly fluctuating. So the way that the cells are taking in signals or the amount of signal that they're taking in over time is just changing so rapidly. So maybe that can also correlate with how, um, what kind of function the cell is going to have as a result. So what we think is that the amount of SMAD in the nucleus can uh, tell us how much TGF beta signal the T cell receives inside of the mouse. So it's going to reveal a lot of things that we did not even know previously about it. So what can we actually learn from these cool videos that take a really long time to take? So we can understand where and when cells are taking in these TGF beta signals, and maybe how um, the amount of TGF beta that gets taken in might change in different contexts, and how this might actually then in turn alter immune cell function or maybe um, you know, change something's ability to become a memory cell. And so all of this information put together and more can give us the ability to then identify more signals. So for example, if I see a T cell talking to or interacting with a dendritic cell in a video and taking in TGF beta signal at that time, I can then maybe look at different factors that are produced by the dendritic cell. So you can say TGF beta plus factor A that's produced by the dendritic cell will help contribute to creating a memory T cell. So, and as we know, the more specific that we can be, the better. And in general, also, TGF beta is a very complex um, signal or cytokine that's involved in many, many different processes, including um, even the ability to fight cancer. And so anything that we can learn, again, about TGF beta through studying memory cells can then potentially also be translated into the study of different diseases. So now we've talked about, we've identified TGF beta as one important signal, and then understanding where these signals come from is a work in progress and hopefully a way for me to eventually graduate. <laughs> but we'll see, all the graduate students in the audience are nervously laughing about that. <laughs> so in summary, TGF beta is an important signal for making memory cells. And in the lab, I study this both using flow cytometry and also using two photon IVM um, that has fluorescent reporters in order to tell me when T cells are taking in TGF beta signals. And studying all these nuances can not only help us for uh, vaccination purposes for memory T cells, but also um, aid us in other efforts in understanding how the immune system works. So overall, um, the immune system, as we've talked about, is very, very complex, but it's also robust because it's able to sort of maintain this balance. Like it's working right now and you probably don't even feel it because that's what it's supposed to do, right? Um, so it protects us from disease and protects us from hurting ourselves as well. And to study these like complex, the complexities of the skin, immunologists are using a variety of tools. I've only described a few of them today 
but there are so many more to um, understand this decision-making process and how um, these signals are taken in to then result in a particular function in the immune system. And how we like modify and change these signals and study how they um, change immune cell function can inform us of better strategies for maybe vaccination or uh, ways to fight disease through like cancer immunotherapy, which you'll hear about in a couple of different lectures later on. So with that, um, I'd like to thank you all for coming today and open up the floor to any other questions that you may have. Yeah, yeah. So when you say you're seeing, if you, you might be up here from seeing a such and such cell interact with such, what do you mean you're seeing? Mm, yeah, that's a, that's a very, very good question. So how do I actually know that if I'm seeing something interact with another, like a T cell interact with a dendritic cell, how do I know that that's what's happening? It is, exactly. So what we do, we use a lot of different types of quantitative measures to do that. So one way, uh, we can do that is to say, okay, the T cell has been, um, has this much of a particular area that is interacting with the DC and for a certain period of time as well. And the other thing that you can do when you observe that is sort of uh, take out or genetically modify or block um, potential interactions between those two cells and see if you still get the same thing. So it's very hard to guessing and blocking. Guessing and blocking. Yeah, exactly. It is. So it's a it's a very like time intensive effort. But there are a lot of other studies that are that have been done by many people before me that sort of help me understand exactly what I'm looking at. So that is the other sort of drawback of two photon microscopy. A lot of people will just say, "Oh, these two cells are next to each other. They're um, interacting," but you're not counting all of the other things that are surrounding that. And you also don't know that if they're just touching, like you might just be sitting next to each other, sitting next to somebody in the audience and not talking to them, but are they actually talking? Like what, what communication is going on? So to look uh, using these like signaling reporters, so something like a SMAD uh, GFP to understand what's happening is also very, very important. It's a great question. Steph. Yeah, so how much of the analysis is like just having a computer do it is, or is how much of it is actually me watching it? So for us, to the human eye, it's like easy to see, okay, this mat is like going to the nucleus, like this is a cell, but the software is just gonna pick up different pixels. So what I do is I will potentially watch the video for like hours on end and then figure out using the computation or which which of those videos I'm gonna do the computational analysis on, which gives me like good enough of a control and um, an experimental condition to be able to have faith in what I'm seeing. So I will let the computation sort of drive the end conclusions that I make, but there are some um, ways that you can drive the computational analysis to make it a lot easier on the computer so it doesn't take like seven days to do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Before I dissect them, the question is how many times do I inject an animal? Um, it actually depends on the type of substance that I'm injecting into them. So um, 
if I'm injecting cells into the mouse, then I will only do it once. And if I'm injecting, let's say, um, a drug or an antibody, I will do it to um, maybe over the course of the week, like three times. It depends on the type of drug that I'm sort of allowed to give to the mouse. Oh, wow. That's crazy. <laughs> yes, Amy. Yeah, good question. So two questions. One was like, are how many, how deep am I imaging? Uh, what what are we looking at? And then also, how long are these videos? So these all these videos that I showed you are actually uh, one hour movies that are compressed, and um, the depth is actually. So I will take maybe like forty different sections. So that spans about sixty micrometers in total depth which is like um, very, very tiny. <laughs> so like one one thousandth one, one thousandth of a millimeter, huh? Like, it's, several cells thick. Hmm? it's like several cells thick. It's several cells thick. So it'll be, if we look at the sort of um, depth of the skin as a whole, OK, there's no chalk. But the skin depth, um, you have, you are actually imaging like part of the epidermis and then more than half of the dermis. So the entire skin thickness is about um, 200 micrometers and I'm imaging like a portion of that yes mm -hmm. Yeah. So the question is, uh, is SMAD a specific messenger for um, TGF beta in T cells? And the answer is actually no. So SMAD is a second messenger that can be used for TGF beta signals in any type of cell. But the reason I know that what I'm looking at is T cells is that I've only put the um, reporter into T cells, and then I'm looking at them. Yes, one more. Um, so the one hour video. Yeah, so to span that entire, let's say, span the entire 60 micrometers of depth, that will take one minute. So the cycle, one minute walking across down. Yeah. Yeah, so each of the planes is one minute spaced. So this is actually all of them squished together. It's what's called a maximum intensity projection. So you take a bunch of, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. And <laughs> definitely don't miss the rest of the lectures in this series. They're going to be really good. Uh, the next one is in two weeks, right? April 6th at 7 p.m. Um, depth is actually, I can actually control the depth um, by